Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. It's uh, a great pleasure to welcome you to Australia House for this evening's joint Flinders University and Gresham College lecture. For those of you I don't know, my name is Matt Johnson and I'm the Deputy Agent General uh, for the State of South Australia based here in London. Now I think you'd all be aware that this week is the bicentenary of the passing of Captain Matthew Flinders. And the big red thing here in front of me is a memorial statue that we'll be unveiling here tomorrow morning to commemorate his, uh, his life and his work. And on the eve of the unveiling, Gresham College and Flinders University thought it would be wonderful to provide a lecture on Matthew Flinders and I guess in some ways set a bit of a scene for tomorrow and the upcoming commemorations over the weekend. We're absolutely delighted to have David Hill with us this evening uh, all the way from Australia and we'll hear more about David in just a moment. I can well imagine that your curiosity is somewhat piqued about this, this thing and the temptation to lift that silk is strong, isn't it? It's a bit like the reaction when you see a sign that says, wet paint, don't touch. You just got to touch it, don't you? But we're not going to. What I can do, though, is show you a miniature of that statue, and it's here, and I'm going to unveil it now for you. It's a miniature of the real thing. There we go. So... So in addition to the, the main memorial statue, our artist, a British artist, a renowned artist, Mark Richards, uh, has produced a limited edition of these maquettes. Um, they're individually numbered and, um, and authenticated. And we've actually been selling them to fund the cost of the actual statue. So there's no government money that's gone into this statue. It's been a, a private endeavour supported by the state of South Australia. And, uh, and a number of private individuals who came together to form a steering committee called the Matthew Flinders uh, Memorial Statue Steering Committee. Now, the good news is that a few of these are still available for sale. Um, we've sold 56 of the limited edition of 75, so that means that there are 19 left. If you're interested in buying one, uh, please speak to me uh, later on this evening. Uh, all proceeds go towards the statue and also a scholarship fund that we're launching uh, in 2016 um, to provide a, a way for British students to study at Flinders University, Matthew Flinders namesake university in Australia. I'd now like to introduce to you Alderman Professor Michael Manelli, Emeritus Mercer's School Memorial Professor of Commerce at Gresham College. As he comes forward, I also want to let you know that for those of you who aren't going to be here tomorrow morning for the unveiling, it is a ticketed event, invitation only, unfortunately. You will be able to see the statue at Euston Station from Saturday morning. When the trains start running, that thing will be there on Euston Station. Professor Manelli. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and on behalf of the trustees, the provost, and the team at Gresham College, it is my real delight to welcome you tonight to this special lecture in this special hall about this special person uh, with this uh, special lecturer, David Hill. Um, I feel a bit like Mr. Bean up here. I kind of want to reach over or get entangled in it and pull it off, but uh, we'll see how it all goes tomorrow morning. Now this is a wonderful event with, a, with so many contributors who've made it all happen, uh, and very much I think in the cooperative spirit of Matthew Flinders himself, unlike some of the uh, nasty competition he may have experienced from the French. Um, and I'm not going to try and read out everybody's biographies or embarrass David, uh, it's all been written down, but what I thought I'd just like to spend a couple of minutes on is why does Gresham care at all about navigation and how did we wind up here today, because it's a fun story. Now, Gresham College, for those of you who don't know, is named after the merchant, adventurer, banker, Sir Thomas Gresham, born in 1519 and died in 1579. And it's my belief that he founded Gresham College partly in order to share Oxford and Cambridge learning on navigation with ordinary merchant seamen. He required lectures to the public, not just in Latin, but also in English. 
Strangely, during his time, uh, and my history is not incorrect, Sir Thomas might have had a personal interest in Australian mapping. He would have handled some of the Dieppe maps. These were a series of large handmade maps produced in France in the 1540s, 50s, and 60s. And they were commissioned for wealthy and royal patrons, including uh, somebody that Sir Thomas worked for, Henry VIII. Controversially, these Dieppe maps depict a southern continent, Terra Australis, incorporating a huge promontory called Java La Grande. Now, historians and cartographers argue whether this early mention of Australia was based on actual navigation, just talked about, or only guessed at. And as someone who produced some of the first digital maps uh, of the world back in the 80s, what I love about these Dieppe maps is that they mark out lands yet to be discovered. I wish we'd had that computer function back in 1980. You can't have any more powerful map making than that, finding things before they're discovered. And it is that leap into the unknown that characterizes our college. For those of you new to Gresham, you may not be aware that since 1597, we've been giving free lectures to the public on a range of subjects, including astronomy, geometry, and navigation. The first Gresham professor of geometry, Henry Briggs, popularized uh, common base 10 logarithms. The Royal Society was founded at Gresham College in 1660 and resided there for half a century, very much focused on navigation, conducting numerous lectures and publishing copiously. And Gresham College was at the heart of the controversy over John Harrison, his chronometer, and the prize for the longitude problem. As the anonymous 1663 ballad of Gresham College observed, the college will the whole world measure which most impossible conclude, and navigation make a pleasure by finding out the longitude. Every tar shall then with ease sail any ship to the Antipodes. And rather oddly, this lecture began on an English train, not an Australian boat. Sir David Higgins and I were traveling together on network rail back in September 2012 when we found a joint interest in navigation. He challenged me on Matthew Flinders, to which I could produce a reply, feeble, but a, a reply nonetheless. He then regaled me with a host of information about Flinders himself and his burial at St. James's Hampstead Road. And the odd platform connection for David, then chief executive of, Na of Network Rail, was not just Harry Potter and platform nine and three quarters at King's Cross, but also that Flinders' gravesite is thought to lie under what is now platform 15 at Euston Station. It was then that I found out about the plans for the memorial statue, and we both agreed, along with Professor Tim Connell, that a commemorative lecture was required, and with the enormous help and kind generosity of Matt Johnson, the Australian High Commissioner, the South Australian Agent General, the Matthew Flinders Memorial Committee, and Flinders University, we've been able to entice the eminent businessman and scholar, David Hill, also of the railway trade, to fly to London and present his view of the navigator explorer Matthew Flinders, which he uncovered writing his highly acclaimed book, The Great Race, the race between the English and the French to complete the map of Australia. I'm sure, like you, we all look forward to David's lecture, knowing already we're going to learn many things in the next hour, long before we've discovered them. David. Well, I can't tell you how special this is uh, for me to have been invited to deliver this lecture, uh, and particularly here in Exhibition Hall of Australia House, because I first came here a little over 50 years ago with my two brothers and uh, to be processed for migration uh, to Australia. And uh, it, it was by far the biggest building we'd ever seen and one of the grandest, and it remains uh, one of the grandest. And to be here tonight with so many old friends, not only from, from Britain, but uh, from Australia, and uh, my big brother Tony, who, who never came to Australia with us because he was in the RAF uh, when we left, and uh, has remained totally a pom, and his wife Gillian and my wife and son, uh, my wife Stigitza and uh, Damien are here as well. On, on Saturday, this, this coming Saturday, it'll be the 200th anniversary 
of the, the death of the explorer Matthew Flinders. He was only 40 years old. Uh, he had been increasingly unwell since returning from his momentous expedition to Australia. And as he lay dying, he would have at least had the satisfaction of, uh, of uh, holding the 800 odd page of a magnificent journal he, he wrote, uh, not only of his travels, but of the history of the European discovery of Australia. He would have also had the uh, satisfaction before he died of seeing and holding this wonderful uh, Arrowsmith engraved map, uh, the complete map of Australia, because Flinders completed the exploration of the unknown coastline of Australia. And what's significant about this map, apart from it being the complete map of Australia in 1814, uh, he's observed New Holland, he's observed New South Wales and Terra Australis, but he added his own Australia for the first time. He said it was more pleasing to the ear. And this was at, without the approval of his superiors. And he said it also is consistent with the other great continents of Asia, of Africa, and of America. Flinders did not discover Australia. Indeed, we should say this whole story is only about the European discovery of Australia because, of course, it had been discovered some 50,000 years before by the Australian indigenous peoples. But the first, Flinders completed an exercise that had begun 200 years before, and the first known uh, recording of the charting of the Australian coast were by the Dutch East India Company in 1606, a little piece of the western side of the Gulf of Carpentaria in, uh, in uh, northern uh, Australia. And over the next 30 years, in search of wealth and trade and gold and silver, the Dutch East India Company sent a series of expeditions to the north, to the west, and to the southwest of Australia. And it's remarkable, in the middle of the 1600s, more than 100 years before Cook, the Dutch were able to produce maps like this, which pretty well accounted for about 60% of the Australian coast. It made the British relative latecomers to the exploration of Australia. Of the contributors to this map, uh, the one that I find most appealing was from the southwest tip across to current day Sejuna, uh, Peter Neutz in 1627, got as far as the islands he named St. Francis and St. Peter, which remain the oldest named places in South Australia, and was the inspiration 100 years later for Gulliver's Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's uh, Travels. Of course, the completion of the east coast of Australia was by Cook. Uh, the Dutch, incidentally, finding nothing worth exploiting, no wealth, no gold, no silver, nothing to trade, by the middle of the 1600s, left Australia with no further interest. Uh, I should mention, uh, because uh, Michael mentioned the Dieppe maps, there is a lot of compelling evidence that even before the Dutch, the Portuguese, possibly the Venetians, and the Chinese had all charted parts of the Australian coast. And while it's very compelling evidence, it's not conclusive proof. Cook wasn't sent primarily to discover Australia, the east coast of Australia. He was sent to Tahiti in 1768 to observe the transit of Venus, which was an important astrological 
uh, phenomenon that allowed the measurement of distances between the planets and the stars, which was very helpful for navigation. And it was only after he had done this that he was given a secondary instruction to sail east to the great unknown south land, and he did this with enormous success. He first of all circumnavigated the two islands of New Zealand. Uh, New Zealand had been found by the great Abel Tasman in 1642, and hardly anybody had been anywhere near it until Cook got there. And then Cook sailed west to the, what is now the Victorian, lower Victorian area of Point Hicks, and then began this phenomenal, in 1770, this phenomenal 4,000 kilometre voyage of navigation up the east coast of Australia. He went through the Torres Straits and to a place called Possession Island and he planted the Union Jack and he declared on Possession Island all of these territories in the name of King George III as a British possession. In much the same way, as the Dutch had put down their flags on the west coast of Australia, and Abel Tasman had done it in Van Diemen's land and claimed it for the Dutch. But the truth is, Cook found nothing of great interest to compel the British to stay there, and after Cook left in 1770, the British ignored Australia, as the Dutch had done before them. But 18 years later, the British are desperate to do something about the problem of a large number of surplus convicts. And embarking on yet another great chapter, 1788, they send Arthur Philip with about 1,000 people on 11 tiny ships to start the convict settlement in Botany Bay, which proved, incidentally, to be a disaster and was abandoned within days and they instead went and settled the first settlement in Sydney. The, the first dozen years of the, of the uh, convict settlement in Sydney was a disaster. They nearly starved to death. It was a struggle. Uh, they could only just survive with the arrival of the second and subsequent fleets with extra, uh, with extra food. Uh, there was very little opportunity to explore any more of Australia. There was a shortage of shipping in the new convict settlement. The British were preoccupied with yet more wars with France. And the only serious navigation done to explore the surroundings of Sydney was by a young 24-year-old, Matthew Flinders. And believe it or not, he did the first exploration south of Sydney in a boat called the Tom Thumb, which was only nine foot long, uh, with his good friend, the ship's surgeon, George uh, Bass, and George Bass's servant. And they explored hundreds of kilometers of the coast uh, below Sydney. In a slightly larger boat, Flinders became famous uh, because they, with George Bass again, they circumnavigated Tasmania, or Van Diemen's Land as it was known then, and proved it to be separate from the Australian mainland. Flinders went back to England in 1800. And this is the scene, this is what we knew. Oh, I was going to mention, at the same time, it wasn't only the British who were interested in the further exploration of Australia, the French. Somehow, in the most turbulent period of their history, in the late 1700s and the early 1800s, committed a number of remarkable voyages of scientific discovery. Uh, Bougainville, saint Eloan, de Fresne, La Perouse, D'Entrecasteaux. And these, uh, the biggest one, of course, was La Perouse, who went on this massive five-year voyage around the Pacific and ended up 
in Botany Bay three days after the arrival of the first fleet and three weeks later went and disappeared. And the French were far more interested, the French public were far more interested in these great voyages of exploration and discovery uh, than the British. And when La Perouse disappeared, uh, this is a painting, a very famous painting, of La Perouse being given his instructions ceremonially by Louis XVI. But such was the interest and the concern when La Perouse disappeared uh, that Louis XVI is reported to have said on the eve of his execution, is there any news of Monsieur La Perouse? The, of all of these French explorers, apart from Bougainville, all of the others died during their explorations, all of them. And it underlines just how hazardous these voyages of exploration uh, into the Pacific and to Australia were. The, first of all, the ships they sailed on, we measured this hall today, the ships were about the length of this hall. The voyages, and they all leaked. They all had to be constantly pumped or you would sink. You would be on these voyages for a minimum of two years. They were extremely hazardous with extremely high rates of fatality. Uh, there was no fresh food, of course, after you left port, and the standard uh, food was salted meat and hard tack biscuit, which had been baked as dry as possible. You could, if you had any teeth, uh, it was very hard to break. Uh, they were infested with weevils, which ironically was a, a source of protein uh, that uh, a lot of the sailors wouldn't have. Um, and uh, uh, the biggest cause of death on ships right up until the middle of the 1700s was scurvy, which came about with a deficiency of vitamin C. And when they called in at the Dutch East Indies ports, the fatality rates, instead of coming down, went up uh, because of the polluted water and the outbreaks of dysentery that wiped out entire crews. On Cook's voyage uh, back to England after discovering the east coast of Australia, uh, he lost a third of his crew from dysentery after calling it in at uh, Batavia, half of the crew of the, the Endeavour. Um, after the French explorations and uh, Cook, and this is 1800. This, this map was published in 1799. And as a result of Cook uh, discovering the two islands of New Zealand and the east coast of Australia, the biggest missing bit is the large unknown coast of South Australia. And it was called the unknown coast. The only knowledge of the hinterland of Australia was 30 or 40 miles west of Sydney the only European settlement, and it wasn't even known, and bear in mind this is a dozen years after the first fleet settled here, it wasn't even known if New Holland in the west and New South Wales in the east were part of the same continent or whether they were separated by a strait. It wasn't the British who initiated the move to go and find out, it was the French again. Two years before the British, on the left, Nicholas Baudin was appointed by Napoleon with instructions to explore the unknown coast of southern Australia to determine whether or not it was one continent and to complete the map of Australia. And of course this prompted the British, Matthew Flinders had only just got back to England from five years in New South Wales, when the British were prompted by the French. Most of the settlement in Australia by the British, Victoria, Tasmania, West Australia, Northern Australia, was prompted by a fear of the French. And what's remarkable about this commitment of the French through this turbulent period of their history to voyages of scientific discovery, none of it involved instructions to settle or colonize, which contrasted them 
with the British. Um, the French made a bigger commitment to this venture, to this quest, uh, to complete the map of Australia. Um, Baudin was given two ships, Flinders only one. Uh, uh, Baudin had a total crew of over 250 on his two ships, the Geograph and the Naturalist. He had 24 scientists. By contrast, Matthew Flinders had a total crew on the Investigator of 78 and only six uh, scientists. Uh, both explorers carried all of the old charts. Neither of them completed the map of Australia by themselves. They filled in the gaps. Baudin had 58 old charts going back to the Dutch and some of the Dieppe maps as well before that. Uh, not that they were of any great help. And both explorers, even though France and Britain were at war, were given passports from the other side that provided they strictly keep to scientific and knowledge and not military, uh, they would be uh, exempted from any hostility from the other side. This became a problem for Flinders later because he operated in breach of his passport. Baudin left first. Baudin left uh, uh, Le Havre uh, in uh, October um, 1800. Um, with oh, both of them had instructions to make it great haste because they both knew the other was on the same quest. So here began the race. But Baudin was a bit eccentric. Um, he was late rounding uh, the Cape of Good Hope. Um, and even before he re reached the French island, the French controlled island of Mauritius, he was complaining that the scientists, the large number of scientists he had aboard, were ill disciplined for life at sea. But he had a problem even with his own uh, officers. Um, when they got to Mauritius, a number of the scientists abandoned the expedition altogether because they were having too good a time. And a number of uh, Flinders officers, I think this would have been unheard of at the time in the British Navy, um, instead of helping prepare the ships for the next leg of the voyage, uh, reported sick and went into the hospital in St. Louis. And uh, a Baudin recorded, he was concerned about them, his officers who were too sick to work, at 11 o'clock, I went ashore and visited the hospital to see the officers who were to be found there. The Sisters of Charity assured me that the gentlemen sometimes returned in the evening, but very late. I didn't find a single soul. When he finally left uh, Mauritius and sailed to Cape Lewin, which is the southwest tip of Western Australia, with instructions to immediately explore the unknown coast, and bear in mind, he's way ahead of Flinders, even though he's running late. And then a bizarre decision that even bewildered his, uh, his colleagues. He said that it's now late May, too close to the Southern Hemisphere winter. So he decides to abandon the search of the unknown south coast and heads up the West Australian coast, charting the bits the Dutch had missed, all the way to Timor, to Kupang in Timor, where he gets uh, fresh water and provisions and sails back down the coast. But of course, by this stage, before he gets to the bottom, he doesn't know, but Flinders has already passed him. Baudin then goes across the great southern ocean to Van Diemen's land and inexplicably spends another six weeks collecting botanical and other samples in Van Diemen's land before sailing up the east coast of Van Diemen's land and through Bass Strait, which had, this had been found two years ago, before by Flinders. So he starts the following year from the east, searching the unknown coast, 
and in March 1802, he bumps into Flinders coming the other way. And Flinders has already uh, searched and uh, discovered the unknown coast. Uh, Flinders had left Bodan, uh, left uh, England nine months after Bodan. Uh, oh, incidentally, the, this is an irresistible image uh, that's well recorded of uh, the encounter between the geograph and the investigator and uh, Matthew Flinders being rowed over uh, in deference to the more senior rank uh, of, uh, of uh, Nicholas Bodan. Flinders uh, left nine months later than, than uh, uh, Bodan because the British expedition, I think, was hastily put together uh, to try and catch the French. Um, uh, incidentally, Flinders very, re very nearly did not go. He was almost sacked before the investigator left. While Flinders had been in Australia for those five years, he had corresponded with a family friend, Anne Coombe, and he was only back in England for a year where he married her. And at the same time, he put himself forward as the conducting this new exploration of Australia and promised, this is audacious, unheard of in the Royal Navy, he promised to take her with him. And uh, after they left uh, the Thames and were going down to Portsmouth, uh, he got caught and the inspectors of the Admiralty who were aboard inspecting the vessel actually reported uh, that they were shocked uh, to uh, encounter uh, in the captain's cabin, uh, Mrs. Flinders, without her bonnet. And uh, it was the intervention of the very influential botanist Joseph Banks, who of course had been on the Cook Endeavour voyage, uh, that had saved Flinders. But I, I think there was more to it than that. The British uh, were spooked by the fact that Bodan was nine months ahead, and, and so uh, poor Anne, it was just dumped at Portsmouth. Uh, Flinders was a very dedicated sailor, but when he had to make a choice between his new bride and the expedition, he didn't hesitate, and poor Anne was left. Um, Flinders only took three and a half months sailing to get to Cape Lewin, overtook, uh, uh, overtook uh, Bodan, and along the South Australian coast, he went beyond where the Dutchman Peter Neutz had gone and he not only charted, and Flinders' genius was the meticulous and unbelievably accurate uh, charting that he was able to do. Uh, probably unequalled or very close to it at the time. Um, and uh, before he reached, he found that Australia was not separated, New Holland and New South Wales by a a, 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 a sea or a, a strait, uh, but there were two giant gulfs, and you can see uh, Kangaroo Island. Uh, just before he reached the first of these two gulfs, uh, one of his uh, cutters went aboard for water, and eight of his 78 crew were drowned, including the first mate, Thistle. And, and there's a very interesting story about Thistle. Uh, uh, Flinders journalised that Thistle was very superstitious and knew he was going to die. He had been to a fortune teller before they left Portsmouth who predicted it uh, so closely. And there were other aspects to the, to the prophecy that later came true as well. Flinders charted the two gulfs. The smaller one he called, uh, they were both named after Lords of the Admiralty. Uh, the small one, uh, St. Vincent, where Adelaide is now, and the larger one, uh, the, the Spencer Gulf, um, which is, uh, and he was, they were both Lords of the Admiralty, and uh, Spencer was the great-grandfather of Princess Di, and of course the great-grandfather of uh, Prince William, who's unveiling Flinders' statue tomorrow, so he has a very personal involvement in it. After leaving here, 
uh, Flinders continues, and that's where he meets Baudin coming the other way. Uh, and again, bizarre behaviour by Baudin. Flinders, in deference to the senior rank, rows over to the geograph uh, with him, because Flinders doesn't speak French. He takes his botanist, Robert Brown, who did speak good French. They're greeted by Baudin in full uh, dress uniform, who doesn't speak any English and takes them to his cabin, but doesn't invite any of his officer colleagues to join them. Uh, they met that afternoon and it was civil enough and they explained where they had both been and they agreed to meet for breakfast the next morning, which again happened, and uh, uh, Flinders said, and both wrote accounts of this, um, uh, Baudin had used Flinders maps when he had gone round Tasmanian through the Bass Strait, but was critical of the, the maps. And uh, Flinders formed the view that even on the second meeting, Bodan had no bloody idea who he was. Uh, anyway, after this, this encounter, and what were the odds where nobody had ever sailed before and off what's called Encounter Bay of South Australia now, these two, the first explorers, uh, bump into each other. After their meeting, uh, Bodan, notwithstanding the fact that Flinders had already charted it, uh, heads west and he does his own surveys of the two gulfs. And what really upset the English later is that even though Bodan had got there first, uh, the French named them Gulf Napoleon and Gulf uh, Josephine, um, ignoring the fact that Flinders had, had been there. It's now the onset of winter. Flinders continues his survey to the east along the coast, and it's the onset of winter. And so the French and the English, they've got passports, the French, and they go to Sydney, and they're hosted by this guy, the hard-drinking but very competent governor of New South Wales, uh, Philip King. Uh, King was a great supporter of Flinders, uh, but he became a great friend of Baudin. Um, King spoke French. He was the last person to have seen La Perouse alive before La Perouse, because he was on the first fleet uh, with uh, Arthur Phillip and was sent by Arthur Phillip to meet uh, La Perouse in, in Botany Bay. Um, the the uh, English and the French got along reasonably uh, together, um, uh, but uh, by this stage, Baudin is totally detested uh, by all of his, by all of his crew, and um, um, Matthew Flinders describes a scene at dinner at Government House um, in Sydney uh, when uh, Henri Freshenet, a uh, rather precocious, 24-year-old uh, lieutenant uh, on the Geograph, uh, sidled up uh, to Flinders to complain about. Baudin, and he, according to Flinders' journal, he said, Captain, if we had not been kept so long picking up shells and catching butterflies in Van Diemen's land, you would not have discovered the south coast before us. Later uh, that year, after they had restocked and re-equipped, uh, the French left Sydney and went back down to the south and then up the west coast of Australia, and uh, they had collected 200,000 uh, specimens of botany, of minerals, and something like 70-odd uh, live animals to take back to France. So on the one hand, they want to complete the mapping of Australia, and on the other hand, uh, they've got to keep these animals alive. And, and the French, incidentally, fed the kangaroos. They had kangaroos, wombats, and emus. And, um, in fact, a lot of them got back alive and ended up in the Malmaison Gardens of, uh, of, uh, Prince, uh, of um, Empress uh, Josephine in, uh, in Paris. Uh, on the way back, uh, they went via Mauritius, French-controlled Mauritius, and uh, Baudin died and, uh, of TB. Um, yet another in this long list of... Uh, 
of uh, French explorers who died. And uh, nobody had anything nice to say of Baudin. The task of writing up the expedition passed on to Francois Perron, who was one of the scientists in the French uh, expedition. And in 800 pages of the account of the Baudin exhibition, he never mentioned him by name once, except when he died. He just said, citizen Baudin ceased to exist. Flinders left Sydney and went north on the so-called circumnavigation of Australia. Now, uh, this shows how he had gone across the, the southern part and, and uh, into Sydney, and then in 1802, three goes up the coast to, to do some charting on the north coast that Cook had missed. And then he went into the Gulf of Carpentaria the Flinders charting of the Gulf, and, Gulf of Carpentaria was so precise, they were used on the Royal Australian Navy maps until relatively recent years. It's about a 14,000 kilometer circumnavigation, but when he got to East Arnhem Land, he stopped. He reported that the investigator was rotting so badly that some of the boards underwater were powderizing and he abandoned the survey. Uh, now this remains a puzzle for a number of reasons. And he's 6,000 kilometers from Sydney and he's 2,000 kilometers from Kupang in Timor. So he heads for, for Timor picks up water and provisions. His crew gets sick and they start dying. They sail down the West Australian coast and back to Sydney uh, and they abandon the rotting investigator in Sydney. But after Flinders went on another ship back to England, King, Governor King, repaired the investigator. It continued to sail for another 70 odd years and actually turned up back in Australia in 1854 during the gold rushes, bringing supplies to the gold rush. Now, what's equally puzzling about Flinders abandoning, every Australian child at school is taught that Matthew Flinders was the first person to circumnavigate Australia. Well, that's stretching the definition a bit. The fact is, Flinders, by going to Timor, and on this route you can see, did not even see let alone navigate, about 40% of the Australian coast. What's even more puzzling is he was fastidious about his instructions, and one of them was he was supposed to find deep water ports on the northwest coast of Australia for British trading ships who were being fleeced by the Dutch if they went to Batavia or to Kupang. So Flinders ends up with a number of his crew dead. Some of them were dying as the ship with dysentery as they approached Sydney Heads. And one of them, the gardener, uh, Peter Good, died after they got back to Sydney. But with the help of his good friend, Governor King, Flinders, bear in mind, they know the French have gone. They know the French have got enough information to complete the first map of Australia. They're in a hurry and King gives uh, Flinders, a new, a new boat, a new ship called the Porpoise, and away he goes. They're in a hurry. He's got to get back and put his maps together. Bear in mind with this charting, you've got thousands of bits of paper. And you've got to reconcile all of the readings and put it into the map of Australia. It takes a very long time. But the sooner he gets back, the better. So on the Porpoise, Flinders leaves Sydney, accompanied by two merchant ships, the Cato and the, and, uh, the Bridgewater. And 2,000 kilometers north of Sydney, you couldn't believe that anything else could happen in this adventure. The Porpoise and the Cato are shipwrecked on the Great Barrier Reef, and the Bridgewater sails on and leaves them to it. And uh, these aren't very clear images, but the artist on the uh, William Westall, on the investigator, uh, painted a series of very dramatic watercolours depicting 
A number of the sailors were drowned from the Cato and the porpoise getting onto a sandbar. But once they got there, they used the, the, the salvage sail to pitch tents and they put up a distress flag. And then Flinders and the captain of the Cato with a surviving cutter, small cutter, and two groups of oarsmen and a single mast, row and sail, non-stop, back to Sydney for help. And as soon as they get there, uh, Governor King again rallies whatever shipping they can to go and rescue the hundred men who were still on this sandbar. And when they got back there, all of them survived. And the reason being that there's very high rainfall up there and there's plenty of, plenty of fish. So the men were given the choice, the survivors, to go with these merchant ships onto China and then hopefully pick up an English ship back to England or to return to Sydney. But given the urgency of this map, Governor King had sent a small boat called the Cumberland, a very small, it's only 20 metres long, to pick up Flinders and about a dozen other people and to race back to England. So Flinders can still get back without losing too much time. But on the way, again, it's a puzzle as to why Flinders did this. Governor King had told him, do not stop at Mauritius, the French-controlled island of Mauritius. And Flinders said he had to because the Cumberland needed repairs, he was short of water, fresh water, and he was short of food. So he calls in at Mauritius, but his passport was issued for the investigator. He couldn't, to the French, demonstrate any orders or instructions that justified him being in Mauritius, and he was carrying military dispatches from Governor King to the War Office back in London. So I, I know it's a very fashionable English thing to say that the French were vindictive and spiteful, and they were trying to slow Flinders down from producing the first map, but the fact is uh, he had plenty of evidence against him by the French. And this man in particular, uh, Ducan, uh, uh, a close supporter of Napoleon's, and he jailed Flinders, and Flinders was stuck on Mauritius for six and a half years. And uh, um, the first, uh, the first uh, years were uh, pretty uncomfortable. Um, the other members of the, of the Cumberland were progressively uh, released. And uh, poor old Flinders, uh, at the end, he only had the company of his companion cat, uh, well-known cat, uh, Trim. I I'm pleased to see that the, uh, the uh, statue has very accurately got uh, Trim on it. Uh, but uh, sadly, um, he lost Trim as well. Um, according to Flinders, uh, Trim ended up in a Mauritian stew pot. Um, uh, as, as his incarceration continued, Flinders was allowed to go and live on a country estate. Uh, it was really like the old regime, the ancient regime. And uh, he learned to play chess, uh, learned to speak French, um, uh, worked on his journals, worked on, the, on his uh, maps, uh, went to concerts, uh, joined card parties, and so on. Oh, and had this... Um, this, um, uh, this uh, very famous portrait uh, painted, um, which eventually ended up in the hands of the crook Australian businessman, Alan Bond. And uh, uh, when Bond went broke, uh, the, the receivers of the company found this under the floor of a, a Bond corporate jet uh, that had reached uh, London. Uh, the good news is it's now safely in the South Australian uh, gallery. Um, I think Bond paid over a million dollars for it, which, which made it more valuable than anybody thought it was uh, at the time. Um, Flinders was finally released in 1810. He, he was imprisoned in 1804, uh, and he was released in 1810. But the French hadn't produced their map yet. Baudin had died. The job of, of their journal and their map uh, went to Francois Perron, 
He died of TB. They all die early. These explorers all died early if they didn't die on their expeditions. And uh, Perron died at a very young age, and the job that was then handed over uh, to Claude Henri uh, Freshenay, um, who was in a hurry to complete the map. Flinders got back in 1810. He was finally released because, uh, because Mauritius was under blockade by the British, and they took it in 1811. And I think de Khan was trying to buy some goodwill, and so they took uh, Flinders out of Port, Port Louis, handed him over to the French Navy uh, under a, a truce, and uh, they finally got him back to England. And Flinders spent the next four years a uh, massive job of reconciling all of his own measurements, and he complained too that he had to reconcile them with uh, some uh, information at uh, Greenwich uh, because the, the readings were, were different. And it was just a few days before his death uh, that Flinders produced, uh, uh, produced this complete map of Australia. He may have been the first to discover the unknown coast, but he was beaten in the production of the first map. Freshenay in Paris, after the news of Flinders' release, wrote to the government and said, with Flinders' release, the British are going to take the glory that is, should be ours, and the government pulled out all stops, and two and a half years before Flinders, Freshenay and the French produced the first complete map of Australia. What really upset the English is they all of Flinders' discoveries had French names. But the good news is in the modern maps, uh, progressively, where Flinders and the English were there first, uh, they now have English names and uh, Geograph Bay, uh, Bonaparte Gulf, all of, uh, not Bonaparte Gulf, uh, Napoleon Archipelago, all of these places that Baudin had found first kept, uh, kept the French names. Um, Baudin, uh, sorry, uh, Flinders uh, will remain uh, one of the, and deserves the reputation uh, for this phenomenal genius of large scale mapping of phenomenal accuracy. And we're also very grateful uh, that he christened our country with the name Australia. But if you feel sorry for Flinders, and of course fate was against him in so many instances, Spare a thought for his wife, Anne. He goes to Australia with George Bass in 1795. He's away five years and he's writing these love letters. He comes back to England. He's there less than a year. He marries her, promises to take her, dumps her in Portsmouth when he's caught and goes at his way another 10 years. He comes back and then he dies. Uh, and However hard it was on these explorers, you've always got to remember it was very hard on their families as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, David, for, uh, I believe all of us would say, a thrilling account of a man who did uh, shape our land. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Michael Barber, Vice-Chancellor of Flinders University, and it was a scary day, but to think we came that close to being Bowdoin University. Yeah. Uh, very fittingly, just a few words about Flinders before I throw it open for some questions, and then we'll have a chance to, uh, to talk. Um, Flinders University is approaching its 50th anniversary. We were established in 1966 in one of the expansion periods of Australian higher education. I wasn't actually around the university at that time, but I believe when one started to think about the names that be associated with the university, it is, as David explained, that part of South Australia, which was that great unknown coastline that really was um, Flinders' greatest contribution to the understanding of Australia. Perhaps more significantly, as David pointed out, it was the existence of those gulfs which suggested that Australia might exist in two halves. So in a way, the closing of that activity. And so much of the South Australian coast was in fact named by um, 
by Flinders, the plains on which Adelaide was to establish, Mount Lofty Ranges, which lie up top, were identified. So I think it was a natural for us looking at a, at a person to name a university afterwards. Of course, an appropriate name for a university, in my opinion, because again, as he shaped the nation, as he shaped the limits and extended the knowledge of our nation, that's what universities do uh, today. He wasn't, of course, in a sense, completely um, knowledgeable about that part of Australia, because he actually did miss, perhaps arguably, the greatest symbol of Australia. He missed the Murray River. And that, but not surprisingly, because the Murray often doesn't flow into the sea. And in those days, I believe, David, it was a case that the Murray wasn't flowing into the sea. It was held by a sandbank and with the lakes in which it, at its extremity, as it empties into the Southern Ocean, were in fact higher than the sea, but they still held back. So one can't really hold that against him in failing that depiction. So of course today, we've come all the way from that uh, part of South Australia that Flinders was um, responsible for discovering here to uh, London to um, unveil this remarkable uh, statue. Uh, we have a bust on the Flinders campus, but there are relatively few statues around the place. I think there's one in Melbourne. I've been standing very traditionally on a boat. This, as I think you'll understand, is a very living um, monument to a, uh, a great Australian explorer. We have a little bit of time, and I'm sure David would uh, answer any sort of questions or comments that would come from uh, the audience. I think there is a roving mic somewhere around the place. So if people would like to ask a question, um, please put your hand up. Thank you. Thank you very much, David, and, and to South Australia for putting on this this event. My name's Margaret Hogg. I'm from the Matthew Flinders Society. We're based in Sydney. And uh, I hope that in your book, I'm sure you did acknowledge the assistance of Bungaree, uh, Matthew Flinders' Aboriginal assistant. Is that right? Yes. 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 Uh, uh, Bungaree was uh, Flinders on the, the great circumnavigation, um, uh, took uh, Bungaree with him, um, who, who turned out to be very, a very valuable member of the crew. In the Gulf of Carpentaria, they uh, had a number of hostile encounters with locals and, and Flinders went at great length in his journal to explain how uh, Bungaree had, um, had been a very useful contributor. And uh, it's just the dictates of time in these things. Uh, yes, it is in the book, um, I think appropriate recognition. And uh, I was involved uh, in in the discussion about the wording on this wonderful statue. And I've seen it, it is absolutely fantastic as a statue, but he's recognized on the base of the statue as well, uh, appropriately. Thank you for raising it. David, hello, it's not a question. I'm Daniel Thompson, I'm the station manager of London Euston. And um, I'm really, really delighted to be welcoming the statue this weekend. I actually visited Sydney for the first time in October and it was absolutely beautiful and had seen firsthand how celebrated Flinders is. And I just wanted to say that I'm really looking forward to um, seeing the statue tomorrow and to welcoming Flinders and Trim over the weekend. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> for this weekend, um, there's a statue of uh, Flinders outside of the Mitchell Library in Macquarie Street. They're polishing up the statue. Uh, but what is a really nice touch, they've got the statue of Flinders, but on the windowsill of the, of the museum, they're also polishing up the separate statue of Trim the Cat. So. Hello, thank you. Um, just a subsidiary question. Could you say something about the Flinders Bar, which apparently is great. Sorry? The Flinders Bar um, that he invented for helped um, offset, um, I think, magnetic effects on compasses and things, and apparently still used to this day. Do you know anything about that? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No. You know, um, when I um, uh, researched this uh, book, I familiarised myself with all of the theory of navigation. So uh, I understand the principles of uh, calculating uh, latitude, which of course we learned from the Greeks, and the much more difficult uh, 
and uh, later solved problem of longitude, which we, we needed uh, reliable time clocks uh, to calculate. Uh, but the risk, uh, even though I'm familiar with all of the... Th and, and yesterday, I went on a pilgrimage to the Science Museum for the King George III collection of scientific instruments and navigation equipment. So I'm very familiar with that. But whenever you come to talk about Matthew Flinders, half the audience are people who know far more about, uh, and uh, half the people here are retired naval officers uh, who know far more about uh, uh, navigation uh, than I will ever know. Uh, Peter Poland, a retired commander. Um, I was going to say something else. So quickly, a Flinders bar is a bar of metal which you put along, uh, alongside a magnetic compass to offset the effect of the rest of the iron of the yes. ship. What I was going to say is that uh, I think uh, Matthew Flinders is also the person who first described the inhabitants of uh, the continent as Australians. On March the 4th, near 1802, near Port Lincoln, he wrote, such seemed to be the conduct of these Australians, and I am persuaded that their appearance on the morning of the tents was struck was a prelude for their coming down. And a year later, up in, uh, uh, up in the Gulf of Carpentaria, he said several natives were seen on shore and left Lieutenant Fowler was sent to communicate with them. They stayed to receive him without showing that timidity so usual with the Australians. I hope we're not so timid today. Yes, that's true. Not only did Flinders, was the Flinders the first to use Australia on the map, but in his journal he made references to indigenous Australians on a couple of occasions. Uh, Ian Crawford, also a retired sailor. Could you tell us something of the role of the Lady Nelson uh, in the contemporary r race around the south coast? The, the Lady Nelson? The Lady Nelson um, uh, was a very small um, uh, boat, and it was only about 20 metres long. Uh, the draft from the water level to the bottom of the boat was only about eight feet. It's a very, very small vessel, and yet it had a phenomenal contribution to discovery in Australia. Uh, there was a perennial lack of, of uh, available shipping. Uh, it was used uh, for the, for the um, uh, exploration of Moreton Bay, um, uh, which later became Brisbane. It was used to move the first settlers from Sydney to Van Diemen's Land. It was used uh, for Western Port and, and Port Phillip, uh, the, the later side of Melbourne. Uh, I hope somebody writes a book on the history of the Lady Nelson. Uh, it, of course, this is before Trafalgar. This was in, and Nelson was already such a significant figure that they had named uh, this ship after Lady uh, uh, Nelson. And it was a phenomenally important boat for a very long period uh, where there was a shortage of shipping in the colonies, uh, in the colony, and uh, uh, it, it, it turns up in most stories of coastal exploration in Australia. One final question. Yeah. 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 Uh, good evening, David. I'm uh, Dennis Smith from the uh, Matthew Flinders Society. Um, I think it's probably also important to point out that Flinders was taught his navigation by Bly, who of course was taught his navigation by Cook. And I think it was one of the legacies passed down that the, you know, the British Navy should be obviously proud of. Uh, and that's why a lot of his maps obviously were so, so accurate. Um, the other relevant part was that it was Sir Joseph Banks that was insisting on him keep adding Terra Australis to the map. Yes. Um, and uh, of course you realise that had he had his way, we wouldn't be Australians, we'd be terrorists. You know? yes. Well, uh, going backwards on that, um, first of all, Joseph Banks. I, I mentioned that Flinders' choice of the name Australia was opposed by his superiors. Uh, he Flinders, when he got back to England, 
reported to a committee that included Sir Joseph Banks. Joseph Banks was initially even hostile to the use of Terra Australis. He, he sided with Arrowsmiths, the map makers, who still wanted to call Australia New Holland for the bulk of it, and the eastern uh, coastal strip, New South, New South Wales. And uh, 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 Flinders finally got acquiescence to use Terra Australis, but didn't have approval to use, uh, to use Australia. Now, what was the other part you mentioned? Came from oh, Bly. Came from yeah, Bly again, again, the dictates of time. Top. A really interesting chapter. Uh, Flinders uh, had been in Australia between 1795 and 1800 when he circumnavigated Van Diemen's Land and then went back on the investigator. But they were his second and third trips to Australia. His first, where he learned his navigating skills, you're quite right. As a 17-year-old, as a midshipman, he was on... Uh, he went with Bly, not on the bounty, but on the second, after the mutiny on the bounty, on the second breadfruit voyage. Uh, uh, what was Bly doing on the bounty? They were collecting breadfruit, which was a cheap source of food for the slaves on the sugar plantations in the West Indies. And after the mutiny, the mutineers on the bounty threw all the breadfruits in the sea and went off to Tahiti and then to Pitcairn. And uh, Bly was sent again, uh, this time with some marines to protect him, uh, to collect the breadfruits, and Flinders went with him. And that's where Flinders did his first recognised uh, mapping as a very young man. But he, he disliked uh, Bly. And uh, it's very interesting, uh, in the 800 pages of uh, Flinders' journal and his account of his, his travels and explorations, he hardly says an unkind word about anyone but in separate correspondence, he made it quite clear he didn't like Bly, and he thought Bly didn't like him. <clears throat> I think Cook had uh, his own problems negotiating uh, the Great Barrier Reef, as I understand it, and he uh, did chart most of that area. But what happened then with uh, Flinders? Did he not have access to uh, Cook's charts? Or why, why did he sorry, take a similar route? I'm sorry, can you... I can't, I can't hear the question. Captain Cook had problems negotiating the Great Barrier Reef. And uh, I think, did he not have <laughs> uh, capsized himself there? But uh, I'm, cons I, I'm puzzled as to why Flinders got into trouble there. Surely he had access to Cook's charts? He had access to Cook's charts, yes. And that's um, uh, Flinders' uh, excuse uh, about the, the, the shipwreck of, uh, of the, the porpoise on Wreck Reef is that he wasn't commander of the porpoise. Uh, he was a passenger with his maps going back. Um, they followed the Cato. The Cato ran aground first. Yes, they had Cook's charts. Uh, Cook, uh, in 1770, of course, had come, a, uh, had smashed onto the reef and, and t had to uh, six weeks to repair the Endeavour uh, on what became the Endeavour River and Cooktown in North Queensland. But, of course, a having, having had that uh, happen to him, uh, you would have thought people would have known where not to go. Uh, but Wreck Reef is a long way from Endeavour Reef. So I, I'm not sure, except that the porpoise was following the Cato. Okay, okay. well I think uh, that uh, unfortunately we'll need to bring the questions to end. There'll be plenty of a time to have a bit of discussion over. Can I ask then Bill Muirhead, the South Australian uh, Consul General, to uh, give a vote of thanks. Thank you. Um, thank you. David, um, just for the record, I always thought Flinders Bar was in a hotel called the South Australia Hotel in Adelaide, so I'm part of the group that was ignorant as well, but um, you might also have noticed that we've simplified Flinders' map here in South Australia, and that, that was because I was constantly being introduced as coming from Melbourne, because people here seem to imagine that there was a line that went through the middle of Australia, and South Australia was everything underneath. Hence that. Now, um, I have to thank both David's, um, sorry, both Michael's, and um, especially David. Um,
I've read The Great Race. Um, I had to read it in two goes. It's a great read, and I commend it to you all because um, I felt exhausted, I think, just trying to imagine what Matthew Flinders had achieved, and all at such a young age, I mean, between 27, or his late 20s and early 30s. So he was, to me, a truly great Englishman whose influence on Australia was immeasurable. And I wondered about what had motivated him, what, what was it that drove him to do this? Because it was absolutely extraordinary. And when you read the book, you'll see that. But, and I found in the book a quote, something that Matthew Flinders wrote, um, where he said, I have too much ambition to rest in the unnoticed middle order of mankind. So I thought that was rather a telling quote. And um, he, to me, was somebody that had a, I think, some link to me personally, because I was born in Adelaide on Flinders Street. Um, my first, the first holiday I remember having was in the Flinders Ranges. Um, I went to Flinders Primary, my first school, and I even ended up in my later years with a farm at Encounter Bay. So I, somehow this was such an obvious thing. So I'm very proud of the fact and, and the part that the South Australian government has played in making this dream of a lasting memorial for Matthew Flinders in his final resting place at Euston in a, into a reality. And there's one very special person who I, I really want to thank for all of this um, because he's made it possible, and that's my very own Matthew, Matthew Johnson. Um, Matt has worked absolutely tirelessly on this project with the committee and others to create this lasting memorial to Flinders in his own country. And I, I've always been staggered how few people here, a few Englishmen, have ever heard of Matthew Flinders, and we want to change that, and I think this will go a long way to doing it. We want him to be loved in this country as much as he is in ours. Now, most importantly, David is going to be signing copies of his book, The Great Race, which is down there at the back, and um, there are also, as we said at the beginning of the evening, a few, cop a few of these left which are available, I think after tomorrow they'll become more valuable, so quite a good investment. And then um, finally, one of the things that we're very famous for in South Australia is wine. And we're going to invite you all, if you'll just let us clear the chairs, to have a, a glass of very fine South Australian wine. And something else we're particularly famous for, and that's meat pies. These are completely free of all horse meat. Um, they are... Um, made by a very famous pie maker called Vili, and you're all welcome to join us. But thank you for coming, and thank you, David, for, for what you've done. <laughs>